Um, when I first came in 78, most Americans I spoke to said to me, it's better to be dead than red. And I remember when I first came to America in 1965, I went through immigration, they said to me, are you a communist? I didn't even really know what a communist was, you know. And then, so this was this sort of ethic, but, and I said, what, you'd rather be blown up in a nuclear war? Yeah. I said, well, what about the pygmies in Africa? They'll die too. And people said, yeah, well, they don't want to be communist either. So I thought, this is sort of psychotic. So um, then I mobilized with others, uh, 23,000 doctors, and we started describing the medical effects of nuclear war, including a wonderful symposium in LA organized by the Saxons and another wonderful one in, in uh, Seattle organized by Judy Lipton, and people were actually scalping tickets at the door. It was so popular. And after, you know, a few years of this, and I was on television because I had a great agent in Hollywood who represented me and put me on with film stars because no one wanted to hear a boring old doctor talking about nuclear war, but they wanted to see Sally Field and Lily Tomlin. And, uh, you know, after a while, people started to say, well, nuclear war's bad for our health. <laughs> and then I was even asked to address the uh, annual Morticians Association. <laughs> And I said, well, what do you want me to talk to you about? They said, well, we don't want to have to embalm radioactive bodies. And I said, don't worry, you'll be one yourself. <laughs> so it got to be really rather ridiculous. But in five years, we, the medical profession, because of our extraordinary credibility, because I always said every politician has a doctor, 80% uh, of Americans were opposed to nuclear war. 80%. Now, that's the second American Revolution. It was peaceful, sagacious, and Gandhian, and all done through education. And that led, and I met with Reagan in the White House and held his hand for about an hour and a quarter, reassuring him because he didn't know anything. <laughs> I think he was a bit brighter than W. Um, I also diagnosed he had impending Alzheimer's, which he did. But apart from that, I think I did actually influence him because he started to say thereafter, nuclear war must never be fought and can never be won. And he started working with Gorbachev. And we, we, the physicians, led the movement to end the Cold War. And we need to credit ourselves with that. That was very, very significant. But after that, we got in uh, George I, who, he was quite good. He unilaterally removed a few tactical nuclear weapons in Europe to help Gorbachev in what he was doing in Russia. But then we got Clinton, and I really resent Bill Clinton, William Jefferson Clinton, because we handed to him on a silver platter the ability to abolish nuclear weapons. And there had been a precedent, because Reagan and Gorbachev met in Reykjavik over a weekend and almost agreed to abolish nuclear weapons. I mean, it was the most extraordinary situation. And it failed because Reagan was attached to Star Wars. You know, there was this yellow plastic shield over America and the weapons would come in and go boink, boink, boink and bounce off. It would never work. It was Teller's idea and Teller was mad. Um, Gorbachev knew it would never work, but both men were obstinate. And they came out having almost agreed to abolish nuclear weapons and they failed. So there's a precedent. And Clinton could have drawn up a document to abolish nuclear weapons in five years. And you must know that of the 23,000 H-bombs in the world today, Russia and America own 97%. And people go on and on about Iran, which does not have nuclear weapons, and all the intelligence agencies in America say there's no evidence they have any or intend to build any. And so that's called displacement activity. If you put rats in a cage and threaten them with a lethal situation, they run away and do something irrelevant to that which threatens them. The real rogue nations and the axis of evil are Russia and America, holding the world at nuclear ransom, ready to blow the world up tonight. And we get very close to within seconds of them pressing a button because the computer makes a mistake or the, or the satellites are set off, set off by a flock of geese or a rising moon thinking America's under attack, or they mistake a, a weather satellite going up in Norway for an attack on Moscow and Yeltsin got to within 10 seconds of pressing the button in 95. I don't know how we're still here. And the Chinese are hacking into the early warning system as we speak. And so are young kids, because it's all computerized, for God's sake. Um, so 
And I'll talk about where you sit here, here today in terms of nuclear weapons, but our, it's what Kennedy said, our life hangs on a silken thread, the twisting sword of Damocles over our heads every second of every day, and by God, we ignore it. Therefore, we're mentally sick. And when people are suicidal, we hospitalize them because they're sick, they need help. The whole society's sick. And they're arguing about, I shouldn't really get into this, but women's vaginas and, you know. <laughs> for God's sake, what the hell are they on about, these stupid men? Stupid men. I mean, I shouldn't be talking about this, but, you know. It's all, what I'm really talking about is etiology. Hands up the physicians in this audience. Yeah, etiology is the cause of a disease, and if you don't diagnose the cause, you can't cure the disease. We can't cure cancer. We, we can cure polio now by, because we, we, we isolated the polio virus, Sabine, Enders, and Jonas Salk. But the cause of the nuclear pathology infecting the planet is the macrobes, and we are the macrobes, but it's our brains. And it's not our neocortexes, it's our reptilian midbrain. And there are some reptilian midbrains that have a toxic reaction to testosterone. And you can name those reptilian midbrains in the head of Dick Cheney and uh, Donald Rumsfeld and other such characters. The other interesting point, I think, is that one in 25 people are sociopaths. Sociopaths are brilliant, charming, erudite, sexy, rise to the top like cream in any organization. There were quite a few of them at Harvard, where I worked, medical school. You can see them in corporations, <laughs> Goldman Sachs. You can see them in government, um, but they have no moral conscience, none, and they lie with impunity. And they're the ones that rise to the top like cream and run the show. So, and, and where we're reluctant to get into etiology, but the etiology is psychiatric. And unless we are prepared to diagnose the etiology and talk about it, nothing is going to happen. I, I do think we're an evolutionary aberrant, and I'm not, much, I'm not sure how much longer we're going to survive, and we'll take maybe 30 million species with us, but we do have an opportunity because of our innate intelligence. And we use, of course, our, our neocortex to rationalize what our midbrain wants us to do, don't we? We can rationalize anything. And the other fascinating thing is that in male midbrains, the instincts for violence and sex are very intertwined. And each of those dynamics produces dopamine. And dopamine's a really nice stuff. You know, it's what you get released when you have an orgasm. It's really nice. And apparently violence induces that too, and they're intimately related. And it's very interesting to me, the relationship, I'm totally off track. <laughs> I'll get on track in a minute. The relationship in the military between sex and violence. Why do they play porno films to blokes who are taking off from aircraft carriers to go and kill people, for instance? Why do men rape women when they conquer a territory and the women have had nothing to do with anything? And so I, I want to explore this in a book I want to write called Why Men Kill and Why Women Let Them. And the women are really pathetic, I think. We're pathetic. Anyway, so it's time we <laughs> grew up and became strong. Anyway, apart from that, I'm going to tell you about Fukushima and nuclear power. Sorry I got diverted, but that's kind of where my brain is at the moment. <laughs> Okay, so I'm not going to walk you through the whole nuclear fuel chain, uranium mining, to, but to suffice it to say that in Australia, we have 40% of the world's richest uranium. We're selling it to friend and foe alike as if there's no tomorrow and there probably won't be any tomorrow. We're selling it to India that hasn't signed the NPT. We're selling it to probably in uh, Pakistan that hasn't signed the NPT or did it. I don't, I don't know. Um, we're selling it, we want to sell it to Saudi Arabia and you know, anyone who wants it really. And anyone that gets uranium can make themselves a bomb. I'll go through that in a minute. Um, it is said that nuclear power produces no global warming, which is an absolute straight out lie. And I must say that I believe, I don't believe in freedom of speech. I don't believe that people like Rush Limbaugh 
should have the opportunity to lie to a mass of ignorant people about science. If we lie in medicine, we would be killing or damaging our patients, and we would be deregistered, like the man who said that immunization causes uh, uh, autism. He's been deregistered. So it's totally inappropriate to lie about science when the earth is in the intensive care unit critically and possibly terminally ill. And so it's totally inappropriate for people like Rush Limbaugh, who doesn't know, well, there's a very rude Australian expression which I won't use, um, <coughs> um, doesn't know anything. And people, millions of people listen to him. This is totally inappropriate. And then Murdoch, you know, well, I won't go into Murdoch. He's, he actually created my career in Australia. Now, um, so the first chapter of this book deals with the fact that nuclear power produces massive quantities of global warming because the nuclear power plant does not stand alone. It is underlaid by a massive industrial infrastructure. You have to mine millions of tonnes of uranium, fossil fuel. You just watch those trucks. They're as big as this, as this church, a truck. And then you've got to mill it, crush it into little fine particles, that more fossil fuel. And then the uranium is enriched in America and at Paducah. They use two 1,500 megawatt coal fire plants to enrich the uranium. Oh, but it doesn't produce any CO2, right? Well, people should be sued. I mean, there must be a law that people can't lie. This is so important, and it's a medical problem. And we sit back, you know, waiting in our, wait in our consulting rooms for the patients to present with their lumps and their indigestion, or their hematemesis, or their hemoptysis, or the pneumothorax, and it's too late. And we don't get out and say, OK, I want to educate you about medicine. I mean, there are lots of things we could do, like why you shouldn't hand your antibiotics over the fence to Mrs. Brown, because a year ago you had the same symptoms as Mrs. Brown, and why don't you have the rest of my antibiotics? I mean, people, people don't know anything about viruses and bacteria, and that's because we haven't taught them. But we must teach them about this too. The other thing is that, the, that at the enrichment plant at Paducah, Kentucky, the uranium is converted to a gas called uranium hexafluoride, which is very corrosive and very hot. And there are hundreds of miles of pipes containing this gas that is filtered through a cascade of filters. On one side stays uranium-235, which is the one that is the fissionable one, and the other side Actually, it's the reverse. It says U238, which is non-fissionable, and this is 235. 235 is present in 0.7% in natural uranium and must be enriched to 3% for use in reactors, over 50%, and you've got bomb-grade material, and the bomb dropped on Hiroshima was a uranium bomb. But because there are hundreds of miles of these pipes that are very hot, beside them are other pipes containing CFC gas. Now, you know... Um, that the Montreal Protocol bans CFC gas because it destroys the ozone. And in Australia, one in nine people now get malignant melanoma because the sun is so intensely toxic. And, you know, old people are just absolutely covered in SCCs and BCCs. I mean, you sit in a dermatology clinic, it's unbelievable. That's from the sun. And we are very racist in Australia. The Aborigines have the highest infant mortality in the world, dreadful conditions, we stole their land, but we like to lie in the sun and turn brown um, in the summer um, and, and, you know, get a lot of melanin in our skins like the Aborigines. Anyway, so this CFC is, circulates through m hundreds of miles of pipes and 93% of the CFC-114 gas, which is the commonest here, um, is released in America from the uranium enrichment plant, and it's 10 to 20,000 times uh, more potent as a global warmer than CO2. Fancy that. How did I find that out? Oh, well, I called the EPA, and I found this really nice woman called Nancy something, and she sent me all the data. And there are many other actual global warming gases used in the production of uranium for nuclear power. So... I can't tell you the sense of indignation I have that people are lying about this, particularly the nuclear industry, saying they're the answer to global warming. 
And I would like all of you to take this into your hearts and souls too and your bones and get out there and teach your friends. And if they don't listen, hit them on the head. Okay. Um, so that's uranium. Anyway, you enrich the uranium to 3%. I won't go into the whole details, but it's all in this book. Also, I, I guess I need to mention that nuclear power is exorbitantly expensive. It costs now 10 to $13 billion to build a nuclear reactor. And you know who pays for that? You do. I do too, because I pay tax here too, which I really resent, because most of it goes to the Pentagon. Um, so you totally pay for the construction, the enrichment, the insurance, Everything. You can't insure your house against nuclear power accidents. You can't insure yourself. Nothing. But it all comes from your tax dollars. And then the utilities grab the reactor once it's built and pump out the electricity like there's no tomorrow, and they make huge profits. That's why they don't want to close the reactors down, because it's too expensive to build more. Now, the cost of decommissioning or taking apart an old radioactive reactor is beyond compare, much more expensive than building it, and no one's ever done it. And you have to wait till they cool down because they're so terribly radioactively hot. And they have to be taken apart by robots and remote control. It's interesting at Fukushima, Japan is the leading producer of robots, yet they had never made robots to withstand very high radiation areas because they always assumed that they wouldn't have an accident. So they had no robots to deal with what they're dealing with now. Isn't it interesting, the psychic numbing that people practice? And we all practice psychic numbing, except children. Children don't. But mummy, why is that? I mean, kids are so honest and alert. And it's only when their hormones, those nasty things, start circulating at menarche um, that the kids go, they lose it and they are able then psychologically to block out up unpleasant realities. And my grandson Paulie's going through this at the moment. He was a gorgeous kid who looked like a face on the Sistine Chapel and suddenly he's getting all hairy. And you know, he'd say, how are you Paulie? Mm -hmm. He won't even talk to me anymore. And as Penny, <laughs> my daughter said to him and his sort of hairy friends that trudge through the house, <laughs> she says, well, we can't really trust you because your frontal lobes haven't developed yet. They haven't. <laughs> okay, so, so cost. I mean, I say no more, it's just ridiculous, the cost of nuclear power. Why do people want nuclear power? Well, again, it's a mid-brain attitude. Um, you know, when they split the atom, it was very exciting. And in my other book, Nuclear Power, um, The New Nuclear Danger, there's a fascinating study by a, an anthropologist called Hugh Gustafson who went to live with the weapons makers in Los Alamos for a year. And he used to drink beer with them in the pub at night and go to church with them. And actually, many of them are his dear friends. And it, their psychology is absolutely amazing. When a man designs a new nuclear weapon that's to be tested in the desert in Nevada, he, that night, goes out and sleeps with the weapon alone in the desert before it's exploded the next day. And he talks about having labor pains, I kid you not, and the need to push. When the weapon explodes, he then talks about postnatal depression. Yeah, isn't that fascinating? So, the emergence of new life, the crea creation of new life is compared to annihilation in these men's minds. And, and they talk about people being killed, that's collateral damage. We're inanimate objects, whereas the weapons, um, they grow whiskers as they get old. They have arms and legs. Um, there's a triad, and they're, you know, they're arms, nuclear arms. Uh, and they have all sorts of human characteristics. And it's very important that we as physicians look at the psychology behind what drives these men. Similarly, with nuclear power, the Department of Energy calls solar power and wind power soft energy, like as my father would have said, you know, his name's Cedric and he's got lace on his underpants sort of thing. <laughs> Dad hadn't grown up at a time when there were gay people. Um, but nuclear power is hard energy, okay? So there's a fascination with this. 
combined with the fact that I wrote an article for the New York Times on December 2nd where there was a psychologist in the Department of Defense, I can't remember his name, in 52, who said, we need nuclear power, virtually is a camouflage for the weapons industry because it's one and the same technology. So kid yourselves not, it's all part of blowing up the planet, which is ultimate power and ultimate instinct for annihilation. Isn't that fascinating? We have to start examining this and getting into the etiology. Okay, now I want to walk you through Fukushima and what's been happening and also Chernobyl and what sort of medical implications would be involved with what's going on at Fukushima. So where you build a reactor, which looks like this, um, and you pack 100 tonnes of uranium into the reactor, enriched to 3% of 235. The uranium is formed into little ceramic pellets packed in zirconium fuel rods 12 feet long and half an inch thick, like a curtain rod. Oh, you call them drapes, don't you? We call them curtains. OK, so 100 tonnes. And then between these uh, fuel rods are, are boron moderating rods, which moderate the flux of neutrons. The whole thing's immersed in water. And you gradually pull out the moderating rods. And then the whole mass of uranium, 100 tons, reaches critical mass. And the atoms start breaking apart spontaneously as the uranium atom shoots out a neutron. Neutron shoots into another uranium atom, which shoots out two more. And then on and on. And as the uranium atoms are hit by the neutrons, they fracture into various particles. Uh, and 200 new radioactive elements are formed, none of which existed before man fissioned the atom. They're all highly toxic, much more so than uranium, which is pretty toxic itself. And so as they pull the moderating rods out, you therefore, as the atom split, release E equals mc squared. Energy equals the mass of the atom times the speed of the light squared, the most enormous sort of energy that Einstein developed when he watched it, uh, suddenly discovered when he watched a tram go by and realized E equals mc squared. <laughs> what a brain. I think he was operating from his neocortex. Um, anyway, so as that energy is released, there's tremendous heat. And the heat boils the water. And then the water turns to steam. Steam's taken off, which turns a generator, which generates electricity. So all a nuclear power plant is designed to do is to boil water. That's all it's designed to do. It's like cutting a pound of butter with a, with a chainsaw. Right? Get it? But what is actually made, and, and how much radiation then is developed in this reactor? The equivalent of a 1,000 Hiroshima-sized bombs. That's what is in these reactors. But then, every year they have to remove 30 tons of the fuel rods because they're so full of these elements that are so stinking hot radiologically and thermally that they're inefficient for the reaction. And usually the fuel pools, spent fuel pools, which they euphemistically call swimming pools, are on the roof of the reactors. And they're packed on racks. But because the nuclear industry thought that by this time there would be a place to put their spent fuel, they didn't build enough spent fuel pools, so they're re-racking the rods closer and closer together, and there could be a meltdown in the spent fuel pools, and there were, there were in Japan. At Pilgrim Nuclear Power Plant, at the entrance of Cape Cod, where the Kennedys used to live, um, there's more cesium-137 in the spent fuel pool than that released by all the atmospheric atomic explosions conducted by Russia, China, United States, France, and England. More cesium in one spent fuel pool. And if that melts down, well, you can imagine where that would go. Be much worse than, than Fukushima. Now, as a reactor operates, it routinely emits radioactive elements because it can't operate without doing it. And, you know, they use these euphemisms. Oh, it's just routine releases. Don't worry about it, you know. I'm just routinely radiating you, so, you know, you might get cancer later, but it's just routine. Don't worry about it, okay? <laughs> so let me talk about what they routinely release every day. Xenon, argon, and krypton. Now, these are called noble gases. They're gamma emitters, and I didn't walk you through the radiation. You all understand X-rays. We're the biggest irradiators of the public. 
um, CT scans give you a whopping dose, never have a CT scan unless absolutely indicated. Each dose of radiation is dangerous. There is no radiation that is safe, and it's cumulative, so each dose you receive adds to your risk of get, getting cancer. Do not walk through those X-ray machines at the airports. I don't care if they stick their fingers in all my orifices. I'm not going to go through those machines. And they are sending fetuses through them. Fetuses are thousands of times more radiosensitive than adults. One X-ray to the pregnant abdomen doubles the incidence of leukemia in that baby. That's Alice Stewart's work, an English woman who was roundly criticised by the nuclear industry until they found out that she was actually correct. She was once testifying before a Senate committee here. She was great in English. And uh, one, one senator was giving her a bad time and she turned to him and said, now listen to me, young man. That shut him up. <laughs> anyway, there are... The, so there are x-rays and they just pass straight through you, but at the instant they pass through you, you can be damaged and a mutation can occur in a gene, right? Gamma radiation is like x-rays. Non-particulate goes straight through you. Alpha radiation, two protons and two neutrons emitted from an unstable atom. Very, very mutagenic. Alpha particles don't pass through the skin, the layers of dead layers of epidermis to damage living cells. But when in contact with living cells in the lung, gut, liver, you name it, very carcinogenic. Uh, uranium is an alpha emitter. Beta is an electron emitted from an unstable. They all do the same thing. So for those who aren't physicians, in every cell is a nucleus, there are chromosomes, and there is, there is a gene or pair of genes called the regulatory gene that controls the rate of cell division. If hit by some radiation, and I'm missing it each time I got it then, the DNA molecule of the cell doesn't die, is mutated or biochemically altered. So one, and the cell will sit dormant for any time from five to 70 years, which is the incubation time for cancer. And one day, instead of the cell dividing into two by mitosis, it goes crazy and produces trillions of cells. That's a cancer. And the cells are very invasive, and they'll get into a lymph vessel or a blood vessel, and one cell will go up to the brain and grow into a second cancer. And that's called metastasizing. And the body eventually becomes full of cancers, and a cancer is a parasite. And it grows and proliferates, and then as the body just withers away and dies, when the body dies, the cancer dies. So it takes a single alpha particle to hit a single gene in a single cell to kill you. Get it? Now, there are other genes that are more important than normal cells, somatic cells in the body, and they're called the germ cells, the sperm and the eggs. And the sperm and eggs carry all the genes for future generations, and all those genes are vulnerable to being damaged by radiation. We all carry several hundred genes for disease. Why? Because it's radiation over time that induced evolution. Radiation caused the fish to develop lungs and the birds to develop wings. And for us to evolve into this incredible creature with, with uh, an opposing thumb and this huge neocortex. But most mutations are deleterious. They cause disease. Very few are advantageous to survive in a difficult environment. But they occur over billions of years. And what we're doing by increasing the level of background radiation in our food and our air through nuclear power and Hanford and the like is increasing the number of deleterious mutations. Now, interestingly, I've been saying this for years, yeah, we all carry several hundred genes for disease like diabetes and cystic fibrosis, my specialty. There are 2,600 genetic diseases. You all must listen to this. It's very important. But the other day, my son was diagnosed with hemochromatosis. Hemochromatosis is a disease which is an abnormality in iron metabolism, and you collect iron in your tissues, and you can get cardiomyopathy. It, it destroys the heart muscle. You can get cirrhosis of the liver. I, therefore, carry the recessive gene for hemochromatosis. You could have knocked me over with a feather, and so does my ex-husband. Isn't that fascinating? called a Mendelian recessive. And normally, Mendelian recessives 
take about 20 generations for the two of them to get together to express the disease like diabetes or cystic fibrosis or hemochromatosis. There are the dominant ones like the, dwar the uh, achondroplastic dwarfs, you see, who have normal trunks and very short arms and legs and big heads. That's a dominant. And at Children's Hospital in Boston, I once saw a family. Mother was normal, father was an achondroplast. They had five children following in their wake, four of whom were achondroplastic dwarfs. So it's a toss of the coin each time, Russian roulette. Okay, so uh, as we fill up the environment with radiation, so we're going to increase, well, we're damaging the very building blocks of life, and most people don't understand that. And they are passed on generation to generation to generation. That's the thing. Once you do produce a mutation, if you reproduce, it will probably be, I mean, two of my children are carriers. My daughter won't get herself tested, and she's a doctor. <laughs> she's a bit difficult. <laughs> As daughters are want to be. Now, so I, I didn't finish the xenon, krypton, and argon. These are xenon, krypton, and argon. They're called noble gases, they're gas, because they don't combine biochemically in the body. However, if you inhale them into your lung, they are absorbed through the alveoli, and they're very fat-soluble. And where are the main fatty tissues of the body? The abdominal fat pad and the upper thighs. And what is located in that area? The gonads, the testicles and ovaries. And they're very high-energy gamma emitters, like X-rays. So people who live in their nuclear reactors, if there's an inversion system, and these things are emitted all the time, they, they could be enveloped in a cloud of xenon or krypton or argon, inhale it and damage their genes. Okay? And also their regulatory genes later to cause cancer. What you also should know is children are 10 to 20 times more radiosensitive than adults, but little girls are twice as sensitive than little boys to getting cancer, and that we didn't, we do, I mean, we haven't talked about that much, but the, we don't know why. We don't know why. Now, what else comes out routinely? Tritium. Tritium is H3 instead of H2. And it's, it's used in exit signs, it's used on watch dials, um, it's used on airport signs for the planes to see. It is, it is a tiny, very active molecule it gets out of every single container except gold, because gold is so dense. It'll escape from stainless steel, glass, plastic, you name it. So you can't contain tritium. And the nuclear industry says, oh, it's only radioactive hydrogen. Well, it combines with oxygen to form tritiated water. And you know there are a lot, often fogs around nuclear power plants and full of tritiated water. And this tritium actually can get right through the skin. Now, the skin lets nothing through because it's the most important organ of the body. That's why when you get a burn, you get so sick because you lose the protective mechanism. It also is inhaled into the lung and also bioconcentrates in the food chain and you can't taste it. And it's nasty stuff because it combines in the DNA molecule. It's highly mutagenic. It's a soft beta emitter. And I write all about it in this book. And there's a huge literature written by the nuclear power industry because they're scared, scared of tritium, but they say, don't worry, it's really OK. It's only tritium. Um, it causes brain tumors, muscular tumors. Well, it causes cancers in many organs. OK, that's tritium. Carbon-14 routinely released. And its half-life is long. I can't remember, thousands of years. The half-life of this one is 12.2 years. That means if you start with a pound of tritium in 12.2 years, you have half a pound. In other 12.2 years, you have a quarter of a pound. It decays exponentially. Do you see? Multiply that by 10 or 20 to get its total radiological life. Each reactor releases a million picocuries of tritium a day. A, mi a million picocuries of tritium a day from its cooling pools and from the reactor. Now, that's very interesting because Germany, and you know how studious and didactic the Germans are, studied children under the age of five who live within five kilometers of the reactor. Five kilometers, what is it, two and a half miles? Um, 
at 16 old reactors and they found that the children under the age of have double the incidence of leukemia and a high incidence of cancer. That's because of the tritium. And that's also because of the argon, xenon, krypton and carbon-14 and other releases they sometimes, you know, just routinely release. The study was reproduced in France and they found the same thing. Now, it's never been done here. Why? Because if you do it, then you've got to do something about it, like maybe close the reactors down and the parents are going to rise up and get really upset. So if you don't want to do anything, don't do the study. Your industry is really evil. And I use that word advisedly and carefully, not just off the top of my head, because killing people is evil. Wouldn't you say? Thou shalt not kill? Okay, so now I want to go on to the other elements. I can't go through all of them, but I will give you an example of some that got out at Fukushima, and then I'll go on to Chernobyl. I-131, what's the, you all know, where does iodine goes in the body, where? Thyroid, yeah. And in particularly in little children, they suck it up like a sponge. It's a, a beta, that a, a electron, and a, and a high energy gamma. It's got a half-life of eight days, so it's around for about 10 weeks. Um, it, when it lands on the soil, the grass sucks it up and bioconcentrates it by orders of magnitude. The cattle then eat the grass. I can't draw a cow, but the active organ is this one. And <laughs> it concentrates most highly in the milk, and then a pregnant woman may be drinking the milk. So as the radioactive iodine passes through the breast tissue, it can buy it can mutate a cell to cause cancer later. Huh? And then the baby, that gorgeous little tiny baby, so sensitive to radiation, drinks the radioactive breast milk. And so what happens is that the, there's biomagnification of all these isotopes up the food chain. And the scary thing is you can't taste, smell, or see radiation in your food, or in the fish you might be catching here that are swimming over from Fukushima, where they tip more radiation into the sea than anyone's ever, ever seen before. Beware. I'll talk about that in a minute. Now, what they're doing, you also need to know is that there was a town in Japan called Itate, which got a high amount of fallout. They looked at over 3,000 children in Itate, little ones, and 30% have thyroid nodules. Now, that's really early. It's within a year. You don't expect solid cancers to start appearing for 15 years. Uh, and leukemia for five years. This is within a year. And you know what the Japanese government is doing? They're following them. Okay, hands up those who know that that's a stupid thing to do. Follow them. Yeah. Well, what you have to do is you have to either remove the nodule or do a fine needle biopsy to see what the histology is. And if indeed it's malignant, then you do a total thyroidectomy. And then the child still might die from metastases from the thyroid tumor. Um, and the child then has to have thyroid replacement, to thyroxin, for the rest of their life, like a diabetic with insulin, or they'll die. So if to follow children with thyroid nodules, and children are so sensitive to cancer, cancer spread really fast in children because their cells are so actively dividing, is wicked. And that's classical of what the Japanese government is doing. It's not testing the food routinely. Children are living in very, very high radiation areas, and they're just passing Geiger counters over the children's thyroids to pick up the gamma. But that doesn't pick up the beta. And what, the only way to find out what is in the children's bodies is to put them into a whole body counter which measures the spectrum of, of gamma radiation given off by all the isotopes. And then you can say, oh, they've got cesium-137, cesium-134, radioactive iodine, there's, oh, there's some plutonium. It's the only way. And they've got hardly any whole body counters in Japan. So they're not looking at the people adequately, particularly the children. Cesium-137 is a really nasty one. Its half-life is 30 years. It's around for 600 years. It's a beta and a gamma. And it's a potassium analog. So our cells are rich in potassium. It causes brain tumors, rhabdomyosarcomas. Hands up those who've ever seen a rhabdo. You have, yeah, a very, very raw, rare form of muscle sarcoma, particularly in children. Um, uh, tumors of testicles and ovaries and the like. Um, and the other one is season 134, which is even worse. Its half-life is two years. 
So the shorter the half-life, the more radioactive it is. And equal amounts of cesium-137 and 134 got out at, at, at um, Fukushima. Okay, this is obviously Europe. And here's the reactor at Chernobyl. And the dark patches are really areas that should be uninhabitable, but people are still living there. And you can see that it went all over Europe. And it's only cesium and 200 isotopes got out. Some last only seconds and they've decayed away to nothing. But there would be over 100 isotopes, all of which have different pathways in the body, different metabolic pathways. But this is only cesium. Um, Turkey is not on the map, but Turkey got a whopping dose of radiation, never buy Turkish food. In fact, from this map, you should never buy European food. Never buy cheese from uh, the Scandinavian countries. They got a huge dose. There are over 300 farms in Cumbria and Wales now whose lambs are so full of cesium, the government told them to shut their farms down. And they said, for how long? And they said, oh, 100 years. It's not, it's 600 years. 40% of the European landmass is currently radioactive. You don't know what food you're buying from Europe, whether it's olive oil from Spain or... Spain got a fair bit and they haven't mapped Spain, nor did they map France, because the French are so darn arrogant and 80% of their electricity comes from nuclear power. They said the radiation from Chernobyl stopped at the French border. <laughs> but they're now finding a higher incidence of cancer. It's developing now in France. Um, I don't buy... I mean, in Australia, we don't have radioactive food. We've got great clean food. We just export uranium so everyone else can have it. Um, and I'm really careful. I rang the man in Melbourne, Australia, who tests the food from Europe, and I said, how do you test it? He said, oh, we do random spot checks. I said, well, how do you pick out the stuff to test? He said, oh, the computer picks it out. So obviously, a lot is missed. And I said, what do you do when you find radioactive food? Oh, he said, we dilute it with non-radioactive food. The solution to pollution by dilution is fallacious when it comes to radiation. Do you get it? I've already explained why, haven't I? Because of the food chain. And that applies to fish too. Then the strontium-90, which Linus Pauling, bless his soul, and Barry Commoner used to talk about. It's a calcium analogue, half-life 28 days. It's around for 600 years, so all over Europe. Um, and it uh, causes bone cancer, osteogenic sarcoma, a multiple myeloma, leukemia, and what's the cancer of the red blood cells where you get too many red blood cells? What is it? What? No. No, come on. Too many red blood cells. Come on. You. Well, polycythemia vera. Yeah. Okay, this is a beta and a gamma. And last but least, I'll explain to you, but please remember this is only just a tiny portion representative of what escapes, plutonium. Now, Pluto is named after not the dog, but the god of hell. I first read about plutonium when I was um, a young medical student. I know a bit older, I, I learned we had a lot of uranium. We've got, so I got a book out called Poison Power by Goffman and Tamplin. Goffman worked for the AEC. And I read about plutonium, I nearly got alopecia totalis. As I was reading the book, like my hair fell out, I'd never read anything so dangerous. So let me walk you through it. It's an alpha emitter, such that 10 to the 6 grams is definitely carcinogenic, a millionth of a gram, but it's probably 10 to the minus 9 grams. When they injected it into beagle dogs, they didn't find a dose low enough that didn't give every dog cancer. Right? It is an alpha, it's got a half-life of 24,400 years, so it's around, you know, a quarter to half a million years. It's all over Europe. Um, it's an iron analogue. It's not absorbed well from the gut, but in neonatal guts it's absorbed because they're immature, and in chlorinated water it's absorbed better. But it is inhaled into the lung, and of course it, it, it lands very down here, and because the alpha particle travels only a very short distance, um, and as radiation decreases with the square of the distance, most cells die within that volume, but on the periphery, cells remain viable and get mutated. And that's why it's so carcinogenic. Now, macrophages pick it up and take it to the mediastinal lymph glands where it can cause lymphoma, Hodgkin's and the like. 
It is stored in the liver, of course, where iron is stored, where it can cause hepatocarcinoma. It goes to the bone, of course, where it can induce osteogenic sarcoma, polycythemia vera, uh, multiple myeloma and leukemia. Um, it crosses the placenta. Now, the placenta lets very few things pass, but because it's an iron analogue, it gets into the developing embryo, which, like thalidomide, it's going to kill a cell that's going to form the left half of the brain or the right arm. And if you look at this book um, produced by the New York Academy of Sciences on Chernobyl, where they, they translated 5,000 articles from Russian into English, uh, there are homes full of the most grossly deformed children around Chernobyl that we have never seen before in the history of pediatrics. I'll pass it round for you to look at. This book also goes through all the deformities and deaths and premature aging and cataracts people get from radiation and heart disease and cancer. And already by now, over a million people have died from Chernobyl. And that's the first 25 years. This is a total cover-up. It's the biggest cover-up in the history of medicine that I've ever read about. Ch um, Fukushima is 2.5 to 3 times worse. So you multiply a million in 25 years by 3, because we in medicine always look at the worst case possibility and work to prevent that, right? Um, these children, this is called teratogenesis. It's what thalidomide did. But there are homes full of children like this, and just pass it round, and you all must look at that. That's plutonium. The other thing is it's got a predilection for the testicle. And every male in the Northern Hemisphere has a tiny load of plutonium in his testicles from weapons testing days, and it tends to deposit just next to the spermatogonia in the testicle, irradiating the genes of the coming sperm. And so, therefore, the genetic mutations are passed on generation to generation. Meanwhile, if the man is um, cremated, his smoke goes out the chimney. Anyway, don't get cremated. It adds to global warming. Get buried. It feeds the soil. Um, the plutonium goes out the chimney, so another man can inhale it and get into his testicle. And so you can see more than an exponential increase in genetic damage for the rest of time. And don't forget, we're not the only species with testicles. <laughs> and the, we inhabit the planet with 30 million other species, all of which um, can be damaged by radiation in the environment. Now, I, I, ha I quickly will do Fukushima. Um, Fukushima is a catastrophe beyond Chernobyl. There have been three meltdowns. They knew in the first two or three days that there were meltdowns, but they didn't tell the Japanese people for three months. Japan's a feudalistic society, and everyone, you know, can apologizes, and the women are very, they're speaking little tiny voices, but the women are get, starting to get really angry, and they're rising up. Um, the amount of radiation that got out is all estimates, guesstimates. There are no measurements. There were no radiation monitors active at the time, except some called C, I think they were called Sieverts or whatever, the something system, which measures radiation from fallout from weapons testing. And they actually knew where the radiation was going, but they didn't tell the people because they didn't want to cause panic. So the people ran exactly right into the area where the radiation was falling in the northwest. The first few days, the winds were blowing towards the east and blew over the Pacific. And that was lucky because if they'd blown over Japan, um, Tokyo would have had to be evacuated. As it is, about half of Japan is now contaminated. Um, the rice, half the rice grown in Japan grow, is grown in Fukushima Prefecture, and it's coming in with cesium 137 in it. Uh, there's a cesium 137 in the tea grown south of Tokyo. There are very, very hot spots in Tokyo. And when you watch Arnie Gunderson this afternoon, who I work very closely with, a nuclear engineer, he's just been in Tokyo. And he had his Geiger counter. And he just sort of put it down. The thing went mad. So there are hot spots all over Tokyo, which is a long way from Fukushima. I mean, I can't tell you what sort of catastrophe this is. And also, there were hydrogen explosions in the four reactors. Oh, well, I'll, I can show you this. Here are the reactors looking really nice and hygienic and terrific and painted blue and white. And this is what they looked like afterwards. See that 
abs buildings absolutely shattered. Unit 3 uh, didn't burst apart, Unit 4 did here. Well, that's a close-up. I mean, <laughs> what a catastrophe. And where did the hydrogen come from? As they lost the, the, see, they lost their external power supply from the earthquake. Each reactor needs a million gallons a minute circulating to keep it cool of water. So when they lost their pump, pumps, they've got diesel generators underneath the reactors and then in came a tsunami and absolutely destroyed the diesel generators. So they couldn't cool the reactors so they melted down within 48, 24 to 48 hours. But as they melted, the zirconium on the cladding of the fuel rods reacted with the water to produce hydrogen. And the hydrogen collected in the containment of the building and when you get hydrogen, it's like the Hindenburg. It exploded and totally, totally destroyed. Just look, look at this. And unit four, there was an explosion in the cooling pool. I think unit two, the cooling pool, had an atomic excursion. In other words, an atomic explosion. And plutonium is being found miles and miles away from the reactor because it came from the spent fuel rods in the cooling pool. It had an atomic excursion. Australian Radiation Service. So for the first three days, here it is, and then six days getting over to you. This is where you are here, and 10 days you're enveloped in a cloud of radioactive fallout. And it was very hot, very high. And again, you can see the 18th of March, it's just hitting you. Uh, 21st of March is still hitting you, but it's passed all the way over to Boston, and they found radioactive fallout in Oklahoma and all over America. Well, there it is. And then on the 24th of March, it's actually starting to circle the whole of the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, well, this is just an indication of where the fallout went when the wind changed from blowing east uh, to the northwest, and this is where the people fled. And children are still living in areas which were evacuated around Chernobyl. The Japanese government has been really obscene in looking after its children. Next. Next. Well, these are just some of the elements. Uranium-238 and 235, 234, all of which are very carcinogenic, causing congenital deformities and cancer in children in Fallujah and Basra, where they're using uranium weapons, it's really a nuclear war. Here's plutonium, cesium-137, strontium. Cobalt-60 is nasty gear too, really nasty. And its half-life is five years more. We've done this more. And this is interesting. This is uh, ginkgos made in hairfin trees just after. This is July the 30th. And it's sort of spring, you know, early summer. And these dead areas on the leaves are where radioactive fallout landed and killed the leaves. These are the azaleas that are all dead. Now, extrapolate that to lungs, okay? Um, Arnie worked with a man called Mark Kaltofen, and you can find this on Arnie's website or my website too. And they took um, engine filters from cars in Tokyo and measured the radiation in them. And the filters were so radioactive, they were brought to America, they had to be buried in radioactive waste dumps. Now, an engine filter is the same as a lung, and it inhales almost about the same amount of air per day as does a lung. They found 10 hot spots in lungs in people in Tokyo, hot spots, plutonium. They measured them here in Seattle, five per day. Yeah. And the thing that's so sad is you see no cancer when it arises. When you cough up your first bit of blood, and you think, oh, shit, you know. Better go to the doctor and the x-ray's taken and there's a mass. doesn't wear a, a sign denoting its origin. doesn't say, I was made by some plutonium you hail from Fukushima 10 years ago. So we can't identify the etiology of a particular cancer. All we can do is take a an exposed population, which we did with Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the Marshall Islands and the like, and compare them to a non-exposed group. Do you want to take some questions? Yeah. So the cloud that you showed in the dispersion path, yeah. are, we get, are we still okay. getting that on a regular basis? Not, not very much at all, although Arnie says it's still emitting a million curies a day, I think. We need to ask him. A lot's still getting out. However, 
if there's another earthquake and building four collapses, which contains the cooling pool with fresh fuel, I'm going to evacuate my family from Boston. And they will have to evacuate Tokyo. You go where? Where, where are you going to go? Australia, love. <laughs> See, the two air masses don't mix at the equator, so the northern hemisphere just gets a fallout. And if there's another earthquake, oh, no, that's if there's another. But also now the corium, which is the molten lava of the meltdowns, is on the concrete floor, and it can react with the concrete to form hydrogen. In fact, it's doing it that as we speak, and they're injecting nitrogen at great rate into the three reactors, unit one, two, and three, to remove the hydrogen so it won't explode. The other thing Arnie explained to me is you get radiolytic decomposition of water. So the radiation splits the water atom into hydrogen and oxygen, a very volatile explosive compound. So we're still at great risk. The accident is not over. There's no way to clean it up. They say 40 years, but they can't clean it up. They can't. Um, and God help us. We don't, I mean, it's not over. This is a, a study I commissioned called Carbon Free Nuclear Free. There's enough wind power west of the Mississippi to supply your whole country with three times the electricity you currently use. You waste 28% of the electricity you use. Nuclear power generates 20%. Turn off all your lights, your computers. Don't hang your clothes, don't dry your clothes in clothes dryers. Hang them outside in the sun. Oh, but Mrs. Brown might, <laughs> M Mrs. Brown might see your underpants and your brassiers. Oh. And in the winter, hang them up by the furnace. I mean, just be sensible. Don't walk through those doors that open and close. They're global warming doors. OK, here's your country. And this was just done by the Natural Resources Defence Council. These are all the reactors you've got. Um, and that's only a 10-mile exclusion zone surrounding them. But in uh, Japan, the American military demanded that the American citizens have to evacuate 50 miles from Fukushima. But of course, it wasn't enough. So I just wanted to give you an image of what you're dealing with. And from a medical perspective, or I would say it's medically, contra it's medically indicated to close all of those reactors down tomorrow. And I don't care what laws they've got or what the NRC says. Laws are not written in stone. And we are the bosses. We are the bosses, the physicians. We understand. And we only we have the authority and credibility to close these carcinogenic factories down which will, over time, from radioactive waste, produce random, compulsory, genetic engineering for the rest of time. Okay? Thanks. Thank